Well, good morning. A very warm welcome to you. It's lovely to, to be back from holiday and uh, thank you for your good wishes and your prayers while we were away. Um, just to say coming up this uh, Wednesday, we have uh, the lockdown quiz, the seventh quiz, I believe. Um, and so uh, it's good uh, for those of you who've uh, enjoyed it. I hope you come back and maybe if you haven't been along so far, if you want to come and join us, please do so. It's Wednesday at 7.30 and I'll be sending out uh, a link for you to click on to and to join in. Um, thank you to Mike and Mike for filling in the last three Sundays. Uh, it's really appreciated uh, that I could have a break. Um, so thank you to both of you, Mike and Mike. And I'm sure you've appreciated uh, their ministry over the last few weeks. Uh, and indeed over this in entire lockdown period. Our song before we get going in the service is uh, the song uh, from Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. So if you want to click on the link and go and sing this song um, uh, in the, the joy of the confine of your home or wherever you are watching this and uh, enjoy singing this song and say from Psalm 48. Will we read these words in Psalm 48? Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise in the city of our God, his holy mountain. It is beautiful in its loftiness, the joy of the whole earth. Let's pray. Almighty God, infinite and eternal in wisdom, power and love. We praise you for all that you are and for all that you do for the world. You've shown us your truth and your love in our Saviour Jesus Christ. Help us by your spirit to worship you in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We come now to our confession, and this is going to be done slightly differently. I'm going to first of all pray, as you can see in the words in the, the light type. And then Mike is going to pray um, with you uh, the words in the dark type, uh, the prayer, this prayer of confession. So let's pray. I confess to God Almighty, and in the presence of all God's people, that I have sinned in thought, word and deed. And I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me. May God Almighty have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins and give you time to amend your life. Amen. We confess to God Almighty and in the presence of all God's people, that we have sinned in thought, word and deed, and we pray God Almighty to have mercy on us. May God Almighty have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, and give you time to amend your life. Amen. We sing our opening song. It's a great hymn of praise. God is love. Let heaven adore him. We come now to our reading from Lamentations chapter 4 and verses 1 to 6, which Mike is going to bring us now. So let's listen to God's word. Lamentations chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. How the gold has lost its luster, the fine gold became dull, the sacred gems are scattered at every street corner. How the precious children of Zion, once worth their weight in gold, 
are now considered as pots of clay, the work of the potter's hand. Even jackals offer their breasts to nurse their young, but my people have become heartless like ostriches in the desert. Because of the thirst, the infant's tongue sticks to the roof of its mouth. The children beg for bread, but no one gives it to them. Those who once ate delicacies are destitute in the streets. Those brought up in royal purple now lie on ash heaps. The punishment of my people is greater than that of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment without a hand turned to help her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we come to um, our fourth look at this book of Lamentations, uh, a book which is not the easiest of books, uh, and I'm sure you agree with me on that. Uh, in Barry Manilow's song, and I never thought I'd say that to start a sermon, in Barry Manilow's song, Copacabana, um, it is a story of Lola, a showgirl, who became the shadow of her former self, her lover having been shot in a jealous fight with another man. And having lost her lover over 30 years ago, she now sits alone wearing a dress that she once wore all those years ago, her faded glory displayed for all to see. Yes, I never thought I'd start a sermon with a Barry Manilow song, but you know, uh, it seemed appropriate for our theme today, uh, which is a faded glory. Now, if you're watching this service uh, online and possibly checking us out, um, if you're not part of the regular Both Thought congregation, uh, maybe you're wondering uh, or hoping for something a little more uh, upbeat than the Book of Lamentations. Of course, if you're part of the church family, you'll know that we've been looking through this book over the last few weeks this book of five poems, and we're now in chapter four. Yes, it's not a joyful poem, but it wasn't a joyful time. It was a painful time for God's people. It was a time of mourning following the destruction of Jerusalem. This book of Lamentations is a response to that destruction and all it meant for God's people. I wonder how you'd respond if all you knew and loved was destroyed. I think you'd weep too. Our reading starts with these words. How the gold has lost its luster. Now, last week I uh, looked up the price of gold and found that it had reached a record high. It was in fact in the news. Gold this week is trading at £1,509 an ounce. Investors in times of trouble see gold as a safe place to put their money. This often happens in times of difficulty. And of course this troubled time is no exception. But when Jerusalem fell in 586 BC, the prophet Jeremiah likens Jerusalem to gold losing its luster, the shine of the holy city being removed when destruction came. And when Jerusalem fell, some people's faith assumptions also fell. You see, no one believed that the holy city could fall. We see in verse 12, if you have your Bible and you have it open at Lamentations 4, You'll see in verse 12, it says, the kings of the earth did not believe, nor did any of the world's people, that enemies and foes could enter the gates of Jerusalem. But it happened. The idea that Jerusalem would never fall had a theological basis. If you read Isaiah 31.5, Isaiah was encouraging the people to believe that Jerusalem was impenetrable when he wrote, like birds hovering overhead, the Lord Almighty 
will shield Jerusalem. He will shield and deliver it. He will pass over it and will rescue it. And that's what the people believed, both the leaders and the people who lived there in Jerusalem and the surrounding country of Judah. That's what they believed when Babylon threatened to destroy them. They felt that Jerusalem was God's own city. So how could it possibly fall? In Psalm 48, the words which opened this service declared Jerusalem to be the joy of the whole earth, precisely because it was God's dwelling place. It was Yahweh's city. And so people assumed God would never abandon his city. And yet it seems that is exactly what had happened, what God had done. We read in verse 3 that it was a punishment for the people's behaviour. Not just that generation, but previous generations who hadn't listened to the prophets. We read, my people have become heartless like ostriches in the desert. Now, I wasn't aware that ostriches were particularly heartless. But that's how God's own people were characterised, heartless. What a thing to say about God's people. Would you like that to say be said about us at Both Thought Church that we're heartless? But we see the depths to which people were reduced following the fall of Jerusalem. In verse 10, we read about loving mothers, compassionate women have cooked their own children who become their food when my people were destroyed. What a thing to happen. Think of the depths to which the people had fallen in their heartlessness, in their desperation, in their hunger. Yes, people assumed that Jerusalem could not be destroyed, and yet it was. Then there was a second faith assumption that was destroyed when Jerusalem fell. Alongside God, God's commitment to the city, the holy city, as they saw it, was God's commitment to his king, his anointed one. The people held to the promise that David would always have a successor on the throne in Jerusalem. It was a promise given to David, we see in 1 Chronicles 17, verse 12. It was a promise given. There would always be a successor. Yet, having such a leader in David's line was important to their sense of security and continuity. But we see in verse 20 of this passage that that assumption is challenged. It says, the Lord's anointed, our very life breath, was caught in their traps. We thought that under his shadow we would live among the nations. But the Babylonians had taken uh, King Jehoiachin to Babylon as we read in 2 Kings 24. And they placed his uncle Zedekiah on the throne. But then when Zedekiah rebelled against Babylon, what did Babylon do? They killed his sons so that there could be no successor. And they blinded him. So we may ask, what's happened to God's promises of Jerusalem never falling and of there always being a king on David's throne? Is God impotent? Is he unable to act? The glory of David's rule had faded. Many people were asking, where is God at the time? If only the people 
had heeded the voice of the prophets of the eighth and seventh centuries. If only they'd listened to the warnings of people like Jeremiah, who called the people to turn back to God. In the end, the citizens of Jerusalem had no one but themselves to blame for this calamity that had befallen them. Instead of leading the nations into divine truth, the people of Judah and Jerusalem were now captive to another nation, Babylon. And Babylon was acting as God's instrument of punishment, as we see in this passage. The punishment of my people, verse 6, is greater than that of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment without a hand turned to help her. You know, it's all too easy for us to hold to certain ways, believing that God will always bless us. Can our nation continue to act as though God doesn't care or even exist? at the National United Reformed Church and Ministers Conference a couple of years ago. The keynote speaker was former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. And someone asked him whether he thought the URC would survive or not. I thought it was a good question. He paused and then said, does it matter? Does it matter if the URC survives? And then he went on to say, for that matter, does it matter if the Church of England survives? Because he said, we know that the church survives. That's what scripture tells us. But he went on to explain how many former traditions had disappeared. And he said, there's nothing that will guarantee our future in the British church. We need to hold on to Christ, to his word and his ways, and not think that some of our traditions, things that we want, are necessarily the things that God wants. I wonder whether, like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, we need to weep because so many have turned away from the church, considering us irrelevant to their lives. So I ask a question, a difficult question this morning. Does it matter if both or church survives? What matters is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. And those who seek after God may find him and may follow him. You know, in this poem, this fourth of five poems in Lamentations, I believe this is a poem of Jeremiah. And in this poem, Jeremiah doesn't look for scapegoats or excuses. He simply states the problem. And in verse 13, if you have a Bible, just read it with me. It says, but it happened because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed within her the blood of the righteous. What an indictment of the leaders of the day, the prophets and priests who'd been given the responsibility of leading God's people in his covenant ways. But they were actually responsible for perpetrating much of the sin which characterised the life in Jerusalem before the destruction. Their leadership had been inadequate. Now they were considered unclean and defiled. No one wanted them to come near them, a bit like, you know, no one wants a leper to come near them. Jeremiah spoke against these guilty men when he declared in chapter 6 and chapter 23 of the book of Jeremiah, from the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain, 
prophet and priest alike all practice deceit. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, I've seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hand of evildoers so that no one turns from his wickedness. What an indictment of the religious leaders of the day. And prophets and priests of today need to heed that warning of Jeremiah. So why is this poem here in the Bible? There's not much hope in this fourth or fifth five poems. It's a desperate piece of literature, but it's there because in the place of utter desperation and hopelessness, it's at the bottom, in the darkness, in the depths of grief and pain, that we can find God. At the place of total hopelessness, which is the cross of Christ, God is at work. God is at work also today in the mess of COVID-19, in the lockdown, in the social distancing, in the companies going bust, in the fraught families and isolated elderly, in the schools closed, I know it's school holidays, but in the schools that were closed, in so much that has gone wrong, God is at work. We are in desperate times now across the world, as we see after the lockdown, countries opening up and, and, and COVID-19 spikes all over the place. We pray, yes, for the scientists to find a vaccine. But before we do that, I wonder whether we should be doing something else first. And that is, like Jeremiah, to lament, to weep. Just like the people lamented over Jerusalem in its destruction. You see, lament is a way of praying. Because there are times in our lives where we have no words to pray. And all we can do is weep. You know that to be true if you've gone through a time of grief where you've lost, lost loved ones, where you've been in real pain and you have no prayers, just tears. Well, God sees your tears and receives them as a prayer. You see, sometimes in our lives or in the life of a nation or at this point in the life of the world, there are no real answers to what's gone wrong. There's no point blaming others. All we can do is weep. We weep at our loss. We weep in our pain. We weep for our hopelessness. We weep for others. I want to end with a story, a story of lament. The hymn we're going to sing in a moment was written by Horatio Spafford in 1873. Now, who's Horatio Spafford? Well, he was a successful lawyer from Chicago who was married with five children, a son and four daughters. Spafford invested his wealth in a significant amount of property. He was also a Christian, a good friend of the evangelist D.L. Moody. The hymn that he wrote in 1873 was after a number of traumatic events in his life. Firstly, in 1870, his four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. The following year, he lost most of his property in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 which ruined him financially. His business interests were further hit by the economic downturn of 1873, at which time he planned to travel to Europe with his family 
on the French ship, the Ville du Havre. In a late change of plan, he sent the family ahead of him while he was delayed on business. While crossing the Atlantic, the ship with his wife Anna and four daughters was hit by another vessel and the ship sank in only 12 minutes. All four of Spafford's daughters died, along with over 200 other passengers. It was the worst naval disaster until the sinking of the Titanic 40 years later. Spafford's wife Anna survived and sent a telegram to her husband which simply said, saved alone. Shortly afterwards, as Spafford travelled to meet his grieving wife, he was inspired to write the words of this hymn as his ship passed near where his daughters had died. He wrote, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, he hath taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. In the place of utter desperation, Horatio Spafford was able to say, it is well with my soul, because he trusted in the God who brings us through the valley of the shadow of death to a new day, a new dawn, a new hope. There are times when all we can do is weep. But hopefully too we can say it is well with my soul. Because like Horatio Spafford, we know that our lives are safe in God's hands. So I ask you today, if you're watching this, if you've never placed your life into God's hands, do it today. Don't delay. You don't know what's round the corner. You don't know when the end will come. Put your hands into the hands of the one who had nail-pierced hands for you, who died on the cross so that you could live. Put your hands into his hands this day. And when you do, he'll forgive you all your sins and set you on a new course, a new course of hope and life. And whatever happens in your life, you'll be able to say with Horatio Spafford, it is well with my soul. Let's pray. If you want to put your hands into the hands of the Lord today, hold out your hands and pray with me. God who loves me and who gave his son for me, forgive my sins, heal my sicknesses, restore my life, come into my life and make me whole. Come into my life and make me new. Come into my life so that I may share in your eternal life. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so we sing this great hymn together. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Let's sing this from the bottom of our hearts.
Well, now we come to our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Lord our God, we pray this morning for all those weeping, for those who've lost loved ones, for those who've lost employment or health, for those who've lost their way in life, for those who've lost their dignity and respect. Lord our God, we pray for those whose faith assumptions have been destroyed by the circumstances of life. We pray that in their distress they may turn to you. Lord our God, we pray for those who've lost their faith completely Help them to realise that you are still present, that you are still a loving God who cares. Lord our God, we pray for the church during this time, that despite our disconnectedness, we may know ourselves to be part of your community of faith and loved by our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord our God, we pray for our church leaders that their decisions and actions may draw us closer to you rather than further away. And Lord our God, we pray for ourselves, that we may learn to lament over our community, our nation and our world, to weep in such times and to know that our tears are received by you. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray now the prayer which Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Will we gather round the Lord's table, that place in which we know ourselves to be loved and accepted and forgiven. There are words in the dark type, and if you'd like to join in with those, with me. During supper, Jesus poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and wipe them with a towel. He said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. By that baptism into his death, we were buried with Christ and lay dead. So that, so that as Christ was raised from death, we might walk in new life. Please join with me. Jesus said, how I've longed to eat this Passover with you before my death, for I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, for let, let us, us keep, keep the, the feast. feast. As they were eating, he said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were sorrowful and began to ask, is it I? For I do not do what I want, but do the very thing I hate. Who will deliver me? from, from this body, body of death. death. Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup 
and said, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Ours is not a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who's been tested in every way, yet without sin. Therefore, let us boldly approach the throne of God. He said, you are those who stood by, uh, by me in my trials. I now give you the kingship with which my father gave me, and you shall eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Blessed be the coming kingdom of our father David. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The body of Christ, broken for you. the blood of Christ shed for you. And so we sing our closing hymn, Jesus is King and I will extol him. Let's sing together. And so we close in prayer, let's pray. God of a love stronger than death, You've given us new birth into a living hope through the gift of your son. God with us, like a mother, you have fed us with yourself and strengthened us for the journey ahead. God of truth and power, you take our weakness and our sin and refashion us by your grace. Gracious God, May the love which bids us welcome at this table gather all your children into one in your eternal presence, whole and free at last. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.